Well, this is the final session of the day, so I am honored and humbled that you chose to stay here instead of uh, heading off to some other, some other things. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about backward design strategy with Moodle Gradebook. Um, I will be talking about this from the perspective of a uh, more traditional education environment where we have teachers in uh, K-12, well, in the U.S. we say K-12, you say primary here, I think, in Europe, and um, higher education. So we'll be uh, uh, talking a little bit about that, but the uh, strategy really is the same no matter what context you're offering assessment in for students. Uh, the first thing that's very important to understand is that Moodle Gradebook is a student-centered grade tracking system. Um, I've worked with a lot of faculty in higher ed who said, I have trouble with Gradebook. Uh, it's, um, you know, I, what, why does it work this way? Why does it work that way? Well, it's because Gradebook is built to provide a consistent experience for students that have many different teachers. Now, teachers need to be free to define their own grading strategy that matches their pedagogical intent. That will be different from course to course to course. Different teachers have different ways of conceptualizing the way that they provide feedback to students. That is a good thing. We need to support that. However, those students need to have a simple, clear, and centralized progress reporting across classes. Uh, I've heard a lot from higher ed faculty especially, well, my grading strategy is in the syllabus and they should be able to figure out their own grade. Now, while I respect that, I really do, and I believe that students ought to be able to, to figure out their own grade from a syllabus, the reality is that a student at any given time has four to six different faculty, all of whom have their own mathematical idiosyncrasies in the way that they calculate their grades. This can be difficult, it can add stress, it can add frustration and confusion to a student's working memory when they really should be focused on the content rather than calculating their own grades. Now, if you're in a math class, maybe it's appropriate that they need to calculate their own grades, but if you're in a literature class or a social sciences class or something like that, um, you really wanna focus on that content rather than figuring out what your uh, professor has put into their syllabus and calculating your own grades. Um, so first, let's give a quick anatomy lesson of the Moodle gradebook, okay? Here's, here's, here's all the pieces of the Moodle gradebook and how they fit together. Uh, quick note, the gradebook and all categories in this are using the natural aggregation method, not mean, not weighted mean, the, some of the older aggregation methods. This is natural aggregation method. So if your gradebook does not have one of these columns, think about changing the aggregation method of the category or the gradebook itself. Uh, so first of all, we have categories. Here we have homework, exams, and projects. And those are, um, yeah, it's a little bit hard to see with this, but uh, they're nested in here as well as uh, colored as I go through this. So the items are the grades themselves, homework one, homework two, exams, outline slides, etc. And then finally, the category totals are the last one. So homework is here, homework total, exams, exams total, project, etc. This is the max grade column. This tells you how many raw points each category and or item is worth, uh, represented in points. And this is the weights column. This tells you what percentage of each uh, level uh, your, your grades are worth. For example, uh, homework one and homework two are both 20 points. Ergo, they are 50% of that category. This one, exam one is 20, exam two is 40, ergo exam one is 33%, and exam two is 66%, uh, well, and two thirds. Um, so let's talk about grading strategy. Now, there are two primary ways that I've seen higher education faculty reckon their grades. First of all is sum. Now, in a sum grading strategy, you have points and they add up to a certain total. In this example on the board here, the sum of the whole course is 200 points. I have 40 points for homework, 60 points for exam, and 100 points for project. So homework is worth 20%, exams are worth 60, et cetera, right? It's based on the total points that you have in these areas. I have had faculty say to me, yes, this is very simple. My gradebook is very simple. They just have to add up the points, and that tells them how much things are worth. 
Um, I do respect that. Um, the percentage strategy uh, is a little bit different strategy where we say, well, of overall, homework is worth 20%, exams worth 30%, and projects is worth 50%. That adds up to 100% of the points. These are the same grade book. Okay, this is exactly the same grade book. They're just aggregated according to different ways of thinking about the numbers. Um, so in the natural aggregation method in Moodle's grade book, sum is represented in the max grade column and percentage is represented in the weights column. It's the same grade book. They're just conceptualized in different ways. So you can do both in, in the natural aggregation method. Um, one thing that I want to point out as a learning designer, and this is where things I've seen, especially during the pandemic, go really sideways with the sum strategy, is when you need to eliminate a piece of homework. Let's say you have 10 homeworks. There are 10 points each. That adds up to 100 points over the semester. When you eliminate a homework, you have to change the grade total of all of the other homeworks to some very strange number because uh, you have to account for the rest of that 100 points. So you wind up with grades that, okay, well now class, we're grading out of 12.23 or something. And um, if, if it wasn't frustrating already, it definitely becomes frustrating at that point, okay? And you have to do very weird mathematical gymnastics to get around this. Now, if you're using percentage grading strategy, it doesn't matter. You eliminate that, that homework, it's still uh, indexed to a percentage, so you can have nine homeworks that add up to 20%, or you could have 15 homeworks that add up to 20%. Or you could have 15 homeworks, and then you could have 13, and then later you could have 24, and it would all still be 20%. Um, so you're kind of future-proofing your course, and if you put your percentages into your syllabus instead of your sum, you are keeping your contract with the students and the syllabus intact, as you are changing out grade items in those particular categories, right? Um, so I strongly recommend some in terms of a mathematical grading strategy, okay? Although, like I said, I do respect, or I, sorry, I recommend percentage, not some. <laughs> Wow. Um, no, I, re I strongly recommend percentage. That's my own personal preference. But again, I do respect people that want to that do it via sum. But just make sure that Moodle Gradebook is calculating it for your students and they don't have to do it themselves. Um, so we've talked about the technical aspect here, but what about pedagogy? What about our teaching intent? And how does that inform the way that we set up our gradebook? Well, let's talk about backward design. There's this book, Understanding by Design, written all the way back in 1998 by a couple, uh, McTie and Wiggins. And the, one of the quotes there, the best designs derive backward from the learnings sought. So you start with the end and you work your way back to your learning object to your learning activities. Anybody that's a learning designer is probably familiar with this. This is a, a pretty standard thing that we talk about in learning design. Um, and, but what I want to do here is I want to start with the grade book and talk about how grade books frame desired learning for students. Now, I really like this picture for this because, I, you know, we think about courses as like a linear place to place to place to place. But what's really happening is we're giving students multiple opportunities to hit targets and get closer and closer to the center throughout the course. We're not going from one topic to the next topic to the next topic. It's just not how our cognition really works. It's a lot messier than that. Um, so uh, having targets that we're repeatedly hitting shots at, we're taking assignments toward these targets and getting closer, for me, makes a little more sense in my mind. Um, now, so in addition to tracking, aggregating, and reporting student grades, gradebooks can be a place to start with backward design. If we show our students our gradebooks, it can give them the lay of the land and show them all the different targets that they need to hit over the course of the semester. That's a gradebook that's really useful for students. Um, and now we're going to talk again from McTie and Wiggins, the twin sins of instructional design. The twin sins of typical instructional design in schools, activity-focused teaching and coverage-focused teaching. 
Neither case provides an adequate answer to the key questions at the heart of effective learning. Now, how does this work with our grade book? Well, let's think about, instead of grade strategy, design strategy, okay? This is an activity-focused gradebook because we have oriented our categories around the types of activities the students are doing, homeworks, exams, and projects. Here is a coverage-focused gradebook. It is focused around covering the content as it's presented in the text that you're teaching the students. So you could think about it, oh, you're gonna do chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You could think about it, oh, we're doing homeworks, we're doing exams, and we're doing projects. But neither of these answers the fundamental questions at the heart of instructional design. What is important here? What is the point? How will this experience enable me as a learner to meet my obligation. Again, McTighe and Wiggins, understand by design. So both of these grade books here could be for any course. It could be for a math course, it could be for a social sciences course, it could be for a physics course, it could be for a, a, a anything, right? But they're both representative of those twin sins of instructional design. I'm activity focused or I'm coverage focused. What if we had a results oriented gradebook? What would that look like? We would have a category for nonfiction comprehension, a category for interpreting fiction, a category for grammar and mechanics, a category for composition. This tells the students what it is they're supposed to be learning by looking at the gradebook. And moreover, it reinforces it every time they look at the gradebook. Students are emotionally vulnerable when they look at the gradebook, right? They're doing self-analysis. If you can use that time when they're already thinking about how they're doing to reinforce the actual topics that you're talking about, you are well ahead of the curve getting them to think about how they are interacting with your material. You're reinforcing your concepts as they're doing self-evaluation. That is what we as teachers and instructional designers want. And you might could tell I started out as an eighth grade English teacher because this was my, my grade book. Now, here's a lot of information and it's very American. Um, the common core standards are the standards in the United States for K-12 uh, instruction, right? Um, and I've put this all up here so we have an idea of kind of what they look like. These are our standards documents. Uh, we have these, but all countries have these, it seems, in one way or another. Um, so for me, when I was teaching English language arts and literacy, I have key ideas and details, craft and structure, integration of knowledge and ideas, range of reading and level of text complexity. And if you want to be really tight with your standards, why wouldn't you take those and make them the categories in your gradebook? If you're teaching Digicomp EDU, why don't you have Digicomp EDU standards directly in your gradebook? And if you start there, then you start designing assignments that target those specific standards. It's a way to put guardrails on yourself and keep yourself aligned with the things that you're supposed to teach your students. Um, and that is really the, the, the point of this short little presentation. A results-focused gradebook can be your catalyst for creative and authentic backward design. Moreover, as your students interact with it over and over again throughout the semester, it can uh, remind them to keep their eyes focused on the results that they are meant to achieve. Um, that's it. I thanks for uh, being here, and I think we have a little time left over for questions. Wow, great presentation. All right, here we go. Really great presentation, thank you. Why don't you use competencies? Uh, well, you would, but competencies exist above the course level, and the gradebook is really focused on the course level. So why I would tie competencies, so let's say that this... You can mix them, you know, you can have, it can appeal anywhere. It, yeah, it can be. Well, categorizing your standards to 
sections. Yeah, you could. So let's say that key ideas and details, outline one and essay one in this gradebook, are aligned with competencies in a site-wide way. I would attach competencies to those and they would report up to the site. But why not have them consistent in the gradebook as well? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I can ask many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, I think I can. Oh, here we go. Will you be uploading the um, slides um, later? I did upload them already. I was a little delinquent in getting them there. So they, Perfect. Thank you so much. They should be there. Um, uh, wouldn't it be a nice feature if uh, the gradebook could show different kinds of categories in which you would um, order your assessments in? So, for example, like you presented and competencies and what kind of type it is. Oh, so basically, so grade items could exist in multiple categories at one time? That, yeah, I would, that's not a feature in Gradebook right now. And that is a limitation of this strategy in that if you're having really good synergistic assignments, they're going to address multiple competencies at once. And that is one of the vulnerabilities of this grading strategy for sure. But I, it is not a vulnerability of percentage-based grading strategies, though. I will, I will take that one to the grave. <laughs> Do you have any strategies for integrating non-numeric grading and feedback into this? Yes. Um, I really should have included something like that in this presentation. Um, the, you can create scales in Moodle that are semantic scales. Uh, the problem, well, it's not a problem, it's a feature. One of the things with Gradebook is that there are numbers in the background behind those semantic scales. So you have to either adjust the way that your gradebook displays to students so they only see the words rather than the numbers. Um, but that's all possible even at the teacher level. You can change the way that the user report looks so you don't get percentages and numbers and you would just use real if you're using grading just show the real grade and it will only be the words in there also speaking of emotional vulnerability when looking at the gradebook um, feedback is open-ended and i always recommend that you show feedback and you like diligently put in open-ended subjective feedback for your students so that when they do see a grade they see some words from you the human teacher next to it so they don't get reduced to thinking of themselves as having a value a numeric value in the course because that is not the way things work I don't, I don't know about other cultural contacts but i know that in the u.s students are hyper focused on the number so much so that they lose sight of what's really important um, and, and I would say grades are for the institution, whereas feedback is for the students. The institution needs numbers because that's the way institutions work. Students are, are humans. They need, they need semantic feedback. So thank you for that question. That's, that's a really good one. Great. Any other questions before we wrap up? Doesn't. Oh, hang on. <coughs> Do you handle uh, bonuses or optional uh, uh, homework? Extra credit? Oh, yeah, go ahead and ask yeah. that again. How do you yeah, handle uh, bonuses, <laughs> extra credit, uh, optional uh, homework? Has anybody yes. experienced how dangerous it is to talk about extra credit at a Moodle moot before? <laughs> I, uh, so Moodle does allow for extra credit, right? Um, and what that means, mathematically, is that the, the credit is added to, the grade is added to the numerator, but not to the denominator of the equation that's gonna produce the percentage for them, right? Um, so I really like to, especially if we're doing, here, let me pull back to this thing real quick and I can talk about it. Um, if we're doing something like this, yeah. and I have a student who is struggling in integration of knowledge and ideas, 
I can offer them extra credit and like check it in the grade book as extra credit and have it really targeted to integration of knowledge and ideas. More than that, I can make it remedial for them in that area so that they can improve their grade in that particular area. That metacognition, that self-analysis is like, oh, I understand key ideas and details. I can write well, I can read complex stuff, but this integration of knowledge and ideas thing is, is where I struggle. So that's where something like this really shines, is that you can say you need extra credit in this area and the student can recognize that as a need and um, guide their development and learning. So I would definitely use extra credit I'm sorry if that uh, that bothers anybody. I know there's you can't have more than 100%. I do understand that, <laughs> but the um, but it, giving someone the uh, opportunity to improve their grade in a particular area can be a really valuable pedagogical tool for a student that needs it. And the the second part of the question, if you have like optional, you have um, a bank of ten assignments, and you ask the student to do only eight. Oh, we have a lot of them. Yeah, so, so uh, this is one thing where you have to go into the custom gradebook calculations. Uh -huh. uh, and I've done this for, I have a lot of, I've worked with a lot of faculty that have done exactly that. They say, look, I've got 10 assignments, but I only want you to be able to improve your grade by three percentage points at most. Um, that involves a custom grade calculation in that category where you can say, or really a subcategory, you'd have a, an extra credit. Formula. Yeah, and you'd write the formula and the custom grade calculation would give you up to three percentage points of that category. Gets a little foggy, especially if your faculty struggles with arithmetic, but um, the, uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can help them make it work. Yeah, it's possible. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.